Good morning. Everybody doing all right today? All right. I'm glad to see you. So thankful that you're here. If you're our guest, I'm thankful that you're here with us today as well. Maybe some of you are watching in uh, the atrium or one of our lobbies or overflow. Thankful that you're with us. And if you're tuning in online, also grateful to have you uh, with us online. Uh, that video was just a short highlight of this past week as we had our annual VBS Vacation Bible School. Uh, just a quick uh, word about that. What an amazing week it was. We saw over 620 children participate in the week. Uh, we saw over 130 staff and volunteers uh, serve those 620 plus children. And then really the one that we celebrate is of those 620 plus kids, 99 trusted Jesus to be their savior. And so we rejoice uh, and we pray with expectancy to be able to see some baptisms. We, we hope to see uh, some, some homes transformed. I'm believing that some family trees have been altered uh, because of uh, last week and uh, what happened at VBS. I do want to thank, he, even though he's not in the room, Pastor Isaudo, our kids pastor, for all the work that he puts in uh, to serve our children. But also along with him, I want to thank all of our volunteers and our multiple staff members that helped serve and make VBS reality. Let's give it up for all of those that helped this past week. You know, it really is an exciting time to be at BT with all the things going on, camps that have happened that have been, you know, to capacity with waiting lists, VBS. Uh, one team has already gone to China and returned. And then this week, on Wednesday, another trip will leave. It'll be our third mission trip of the year, as we'll have just over 20 people heading to New York City to partner with our sister church there, Connection Church in Queens. And they'll be going to serve the community, to build relationships, uh, to be uh, a platform for the gospel for Connection Church to launch off of, and so we're excited for that. So if you're a part of the New York City mission team, I'm going to ask you if you could quickly stand up and just make your way right up here, gather together up here on the uh, my right side of this table. Y'all come on now. Don't be shy. They may be shy. Let, let's give it up for the New York City team, will we? And so again, they'll leave this Wednesday, they'll return the following Wednesday, they'll be there for a full week, and we're excited for the appointments God has already put in place uh, for the paths that will be crossed at various parks uh, as they walk through the neighborhoods and as they make much of Jesus. So would you join me, BT, by extending an arm out here towards the team? And would you remember also this week to pray for them as they leave, and would you join me as we lift them up now? Father, I'm thankful for uh, this group. Uh, for the fact that you have appointed them for such a time as this, that, that maybe they didn't know it a year ago, they may not have known it six months ago, they may not have known it a few weeks ago. But God, you have uh, good works prepared for them beforehand to be accomplished this next week. So I'm thankful for each person. Uh, I'm thankful for uh, their willingness to go. I pray that you would guide them and direct them. Father, I pray that they would be able to, to enjoy their time uh, and enjoy the blessing of being able to travel to make much of Jesus. Father, I pray uh, that you would uh, have anointed and appointed conversations for them. Father, I pray that the fruit of this week would be something that Connection Church can continue upon, that, that there would be lives transformed, that the church could see growth and could see uh, a rising up of, of new people and leaders, and that, Father, that this week would not be a week that stands alone, but just be a week uh, that produces continued ministry for Connection Church. We're thankful for the leaders there. Pray you bless them and keep them. Father, pray you bless the leaders that are leading on this trip. Pray for Danny as he leads out. And God, we just uh, look forward to hearing the report of all that happened when they return. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, remember to be praying for them this week. They'll head out on Wednesday. And I'll be back the following Wednesday. And we look forward to, to hearing what will happen for, uh, during our third mission trip of the year. Uh, next week, another team will head to Houston. And so I'm just excited that we're a church that is sending people out. Amen? All right. Well, I am excited for today because today marks the beginning. Actually, last night, our first service of the weekend. But this weekend marks the beginning of Daring Faith, this campaign that we've been talking about for quite some time that we are launching into. Uh, if you haven't heard about it, let me remind you what we're doing for the next six weeks. Our weekend services will be preaching through the book of Hebrews chapter 11. So, so I encourage you to be reading the chapter. Read it each week for six weeks. You'll get real familiar with it. That's a good thing, right? And so read it a few times a week. We'll be preaching verse by verse through Hebrews chapter 11. Also, starting this week, all of our kids' ministry on Sunday morning will be talking about daring faith. 
All of our student ministries, middle school and high school, will be talking about daring faith. All of our on-campus classes on Sunday morning, guess what they're going to talk about? You're starting to put this together now. Uh, Wednesday night, we'll have groups that will meet on campus, community groups on campus. Guess what they'll talk about? Daring faith. All the community groups that meet in homes throughout the week in various locations, guess what they're talking about? Ah, I think you figured this out. The only way you maybe haven't figured it out is if you haven't signed up for a Daring Faith group yet, okay? Uh, I am believing God to do big things in these next six weeks. You know, most of the time churches talk about the summer dip. It's the time when people go on vacation. We're for that. We hope you get some rest and get, get some fun on your vacations. But people go on vacation, so you see a dip in attendance. People go on vacations, and their tithe goes on vacation for some reason. Uh, you can give online. And, and so you see a dip in giving. <laughs> Shameless plug. And so, you know, in, in, in the ministry world, you just kind of come to, to understand that's going to happen. But we're not doing that this summer at BT. We're, we're not preparing for the summer dip. We're asking God for the summer increase. We're praying for an increase. See, we, we've seen steady increase in our attendance. We're praying for that to continue. We're praying for a steady increase in community groups. As we've launched that ministry, uh, we've seen new groups get started uh, th throughout the past semesters. And so we're looking for more groups to start. We're looking for not just continuing to meet budget, praise the Lord, but a continued increase in exceeding the budget need. Uh, all, we, are, we are praying for uh, the unexpected and that is, again, this summer increase. And so we thought it would make sense. Some people would say it's not strategic because it's not the best time. It's the summer. But we thought it would be the perfect time to launch into this campaign called Daring Faith. And so I believe in the next six weeks we'll be challenged as individuals. Uh, if you have the book, you're in a community group, you're going to be challenged. Hear, hear me. Every person in the room, all right, myself and every person has an area in their life where they need to trust God fully. Maybe, maybe there's a sickness, maybe there's a hurt, right? Maybe there's a financial issue, there's a work issue, a dream issue, a relational issue. All of us have an area in our life where we need to trust God fully. And I believe these next six weeks we'll be challenged to let go of some things and to lay it over and to give it over to him. I believe as a church, we will corporately be challenged over the next six weeks. We are talking about things, we're believing things that can only happen when we believe God can do it. And so when we talk about seeing the Rio Grande Valley experience revival, I believe that in my heart. But it will take daring faith to step out, to, to make bold steps to see that happen. To see hundreds and thousands of people in the coming days, weeks, months, and years trust Jesus as their Savior. To see what in so many, in, in so many conversations what's a forgotten area down here. To see it become the center of growth uh, for the work and the movement of Christ. Uh, it's going to take a daring faith to start more campuses, to, to plant new churches, to send out more missionaries. You know, here, here's a real practical one. We're going to start talking about this more in the coming weeks. We're going to be showing you some pictures and putting some models out of the youth building that we believe God's called us to build. We're going to start raising money that will take faith to give trusting God. And then by God's grace and Lord willing, sometime in the beginning part of 2018, we'll start building that building, right? And we'll see, we'll see work done and a foundation poured and, and walls go up. And each step of the process is going to take, guess what? Money. Daring faith, right? <laughs> Men money. Money's given through the daring faith, yeah. So, But yes, it will take money. <laughs> and so we're going to launch into that today. And as we jump into the book of Hebrews, looking at verses 1 through 6, we're going to talk about what does it look like to build a life of faith. You know, I, I just want to say this, I, I think the fact that we are having a series called Daring Faith in some ways points to the struggle in our society. Because I, I think daring faith is somewhat of an oxymoron. I think that's the only kind of faith God ever intended us to have. I believe the only kind of faith God ever intended us to have was daring faith. But somewhere along the way, we've created this concept that, that, that it's about the quantity of faith, right? And so, you know what? I'm trusting God, maybe, I'm trusting God with my eternity. And this is kind of silly if you think about it. We'll trust God with eternity. We just won't trust him with tomorrow. <laughs> but so I'm trusting God to save me, but I'm not really trusting him with my finances yet. Or I'm not really trusting him with my family yet or with my dreams yet. I've got to make sure I get the job that I want. So I'm not really going to kind of seek his direction or, or step out where he's calling me. I'm not going to trust him with my hurts because he, he might ask me to get over it, right? And, 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 so, and so what happens is we begin to have this conversation where, you know, I, I, I'm good here, but I need more faith here. You know, but the problem with the equation where we talk about having more or less faith is we're still the object. 
I, I just need to have more faith. You know, I believe when we read the scripture and we see Jesus speak of faith, I don't believe he's speaking to quantity of faith. I think he's speaking to object of faith. I know that Jesus says, you know, he says to some people, oh, you of little faith. I don't think he's actually addressing, if you look at it contextually, I don't think he's addressing the fact that they have not enough faith. I, I, I think he's addressing they don't have faith in the right thing, which is God. Remember, Jesus is the one who tells us that if we have mustard seed size faith, we'll tell the mountain to move and it will happen. And so somewhere along the way, what's happened is there's been a shift and we've bought into this concept that it's still all about us and we just got to muster up more faith. We got to do better. It's about our performance. I love what Danny said earlier. It's not our performance. It's his performance. I don't need more faith in me. I need faith in him. And so my prayer is that as we launch into this series today, this campaign, we'll talk about and come to understand some real basics, by the way. It's going to be simple stuff, but it's stuff we need to be reminded of. I pray that we'll begin to be reminded or maybe for the first time to learn what it takes and what it looks like to build a life of faith. <clears throat> so we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to start in verse 1, and this is what it says. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Verse four, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Let's pray. Father, in these next few moments, I pray that our, our minds, our ears, and our hearts would be open. Father, I pray that you would begin right now. I pray you've already started the process as we worship. But God, I pray that you would begin to clarify with a supernatural focus the areas in our lives that we need to trust you more. Father, the areas in our lives we need to trust you fully. And so God, I pray today against the work of the enemy in our hearts. And I pray against the despair that he wants to weave and the depression that he wants to bring about. So Father, today I pray for restoration. God, I pray today we'd be able to trust you even when we don't see you. God, I pray for all the areas of concern that are represented in this room, financial emotional, relational, and spiritual. And Father, I pray today that if anyone's come in here or is watching online and Father, they don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ that leads to salvation, that they would have the daring faith it takes to give their life to you and to experience new life. I pray that you're glorified and your church is blessed. It's in Jesus' name, amen. You know, when we jump into the text here, looking at verse, verse 1, you know, the first thing that we see is a definition of faith, right? Now, probably a lot of you are somewhat familiar with Hebrews 11.1. 1. You've heard it preached. You've had it in a Bible study. Maybe some of you have it somewhat memorized, right? You can more or less quote it, right? And so for a, for a good number of us, probably, hearing the words, you know, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, it's nothing new. But what I believe to be true, what I believe to be true for me, putting myself in the same boat, what I've found in my own life, almost 20 years walking with Jesus and almost 20 years serving the church, is while a lot of times we may have some level of familiarity with Hebrews 11.1, 1, what we haven't done is what David says in the Psalms, we haven't hidden God's word in our hearts. Why do I say that? Because we go through life, right? Well, let me just break down the definition. It says, faith, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. If you think about that statement, it's kind of odd in our, in our world, isn't it? Because when you hope for something, doesn't it by default come with a level of uncertainty? Right? I mean, we're, we're going we're gonna, to, you know, interaction today. You're hoping for something, so by default you have not attained. Let, let me give you an example. We, we're a few months away from the fall, and so September's going to come. The NFL season will kick off, and for almost 38 years, I have hoped for a Cowboy Super Bowl. <laughs> right? I hope for it. I'm about to start the hope train again, right? But there's a level of uncertainty, because in 38 years in my life, it's only happened three times. 
Well, some of you outdate me, and you've got five of them, and I'm envious of that, but, but only three times for me. And, and so th- there's a hope, right? But do you see that that hope doesn't bring about a whole lot of assurance? Why is, why is faith in God different? Because as much as I love the Cowboys, and it pains me to admit it, they can't, they can't guarantee me anything. But God can. And so this somewhat paradoxical thought, that these, these things that don't seem to go together, faith is the assurance, it's the certainty of things that seem uncertain. <laughs> it's the assurance of things hoped for. And then the second part of the definition, it's the conviction, the bold belief. What I say, it's the belief in your bones of the things you do not see. So let me bring it all together. Why did I say that while we may know the verse, we haven't hidden it in our hearts? Because, you know what, sometimes in life, we see God working, amen? I want, you to hear, I, want you to, I want to be clear, don't misunderstand me. There are many times we see God. Now, we can always see him in creation. Every time the sun is up, the moon, we see creation. But personally, right, you're with me? A lot of us can give testimony of the times we have personally seen God work. We can give testimony of when we've heard his voice. We can give testimony of when we've felt his presence. And amen for those testimonies. But what I've just found in my own Christian life is that the the, the faith Jesus is calling me to have isn't just the faith that says, God, I feel you and I hear you and I see you and, you know, hoorah for God. No, it's, it's when I don't see him. It's when I don't hear him. It's when I don't feel him that I can still have a conviction, a belief in my bones that he's there and he's for me. See, that, that's daring faith. You can see how it only takes a mustard seed size of that stuff to get you through, right? And it, hear me, it's difficult to not let the, the curveballs of life cause us to get thrown. But we, we launch in and we see this definition that will set up the rest of what we're gonna talk about. And so let's, let's move through the text and see what a, a life built on faith looks like. The first thing that I see is that daring faith relies on the promises and power of God. Daring faith relies on the promises and power of God. This is, you know, I said it's basic, right? But let's, get, let's just get reminded of these basics. We've moved through verse one. Verse two goes on to tell us, for by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Daring faith trusts and hopes in God. Daring faith relies on God's promises. Every person in the room has a promise from God. You're like, no, I don't. If you're a believer, you do. If you're a believer, you've been promised he'll never leave you or forsake you. I don't feel him. You have a promise that he will never leave you or forsake you. I know it's difficult, but it's still a choice. Do you believe it? As a believer, you have a promise that one day this world and all the suffering it brings will pass away. You have a promise that he has plans for you. So daring faith relies on the promises and the power of God. You know, you know what we do sometimes? Sometimes we claim the promises of God and we try to bring it about by our power. <laughs> like God's got this for me, right? You know, I, I have studied this. I, I've said before, the, our identity in Christ is one of the big things that I study. In, in some point in time, one day, one year, I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to preach on the life of Elijah because I think he, he, he illustrates this. You see, this is what happens so many times. I think scripture supports it, and I know that my own testimony supports it. We, we, we have a promise to claim, right? And we love that, right? I mean, we want to claim the promise. So, and God gives us promises. But not, al- not always, but it is, it is not uncommon that when you receive the promise, there's a little bit of a waiting period before the payoff, right? That makes sense? Anybody? Okay, Here, here's an example. You were, at some point in time, you trusted Jesus. My story, I trusted Jesus March 4th, 1998. I've, be, I've been living with him ever since. I've been praying for what he prayed for, that his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm praying for earth to look like heaven. But one day, I will actually be there. That's a promise. Guess what? There's a process in between, right? So between the promise and the payoff, there's a process. The process is not always fun. But it's the process that gives us the eyes to see the fulfillment. And it's in that process 
that faith becomes real. It's in that process that we have assurance of what we're hoping for and conviction of what we can't see. And so a daring faith will always rely on the promises and the power of God. You know, I love the way that verse 2 illustrates this. Verse 2 is talking about Old Testament saints. It says, for by it, it's being faith, the people of old were commended. So let's just, let's just build some things together. You with me? I'm going to need you to chime in here. It tells us that by it, what's the it? Faith, right? We're connecting pronouns with, okay, so, so by faith, the people of old, that's the Old Testament saints, were commended. If, if, so I, I have my friend Angel here, right? And if I'm going to commend Angel for something, does that mean I am pleased with him or displeased with him? Please, right? If I was condemning him, it would, but commending, hear the word. So by faith, people of old were commended. They were found pleasing to God. Verse six tells us that the only way to be pleasing to God is through faith, because without faith, you can't know God. You with me? Okay. So here's a question I've dealt with in 20 years of ministry. Why is God different in the Old Testament than the New Testament? In New Testament, we trust in Jesus, and that's how we get saved. But in the Old Testament, people had to sacrifice. False. In the Old Testament, people did sacrifices because it pointed to Jesus. Are you with me? In the Old Testament, if you're not familiar with it, people had to go. They took grain. They took birds. They took sheep. They took oxen. They sacrificed them, and the, it was a payment for sin. In fact, one time a year, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the high priest would sacrifice a sheep, and it would be a symbolic sacrifice to cover all the sins of Israel. You with me? So one got sacrificed, but here's the cool part. One got released. And the sheep that got released, the scapegoat, if you will, was symbolic of Israel not being punished, not receiving justice for their sins, okay? So, so we read the Old Testament and then we say, okay, in the Old Testament, people had to keep sacrificing. Like if they, if they missed Yom Kippur or if they missed their sacrifice, they must have gone to hell. See, we believe in an attribute of God called his immutability. Everybody say immutability, that doesn't mean that he doesn't stop talking. It means he doesn't change. It means he, God is not operating differently. It's just that the sacrificial system has been fulfilled. That's why Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish. I came to fulfill the law. So if you've ever wondered how people in the Old Testament got saved, just read verse 2 of Hebrews chapter 11. For by faith they pleased God. Not by sacrifice. Not by works. Not by doing. By faith they pleased God. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because it's the what? Anybody help me out? Anybody know the verse? It is the power unto salvation. I know it's basic, but, but let's be reminded that daring faith will always rely on the promises of God and the power of God to fulfill those. And so as we continue in verses 4, 5, and 6, what we see next is really where, where I want to spend most of my time. Because the next thing that we see about building a life of faith is that daring faith relies on God's plans and purposes. A daring faith relies on God's plans and purposes. And, and this is where we struggle, okay? This is where the, the, the heart of the sermon is going to be. Like, I want to claim God's promises, and I even want to claim his power. I don't know that I want to claim his plans if they're different from mine, though. Could God give me some promises and use his power to do my plans instead? Like, could, could his purposes, could, could, you know, could my purposes match up with his power and just, you know, I mean, let's meet in the middle, right? Let's just compromise a little bit, God. See, that's not a daring faith. That's the faith that sadly many times believers across the world live with. And it's why, it's why we feel powerless and not victorious. But a daring faith relies on God's plans and his purposes. In verses four through six, we see the, the author of Hebrews talk about three Old Testament characters, Abel, Cain, and Enoch. Two of these three had faith in the right object. One of them did not. Two of these three had total faith in the right object. One of them did not. If you're not familiar with the story of of Cain and Abel, if you're not familiar with the story of Enoch, let me just kind of cut to the chase for the sake of time. What we know about Abel and Enoch is that their faith was solely in God. What we know about Cain, it's not that he had no faith in God, he just had divided faith in God. And I believe this is where it's going to hit most of us today. 
I think one of the plagues of our churches today is a divided faith. So what I said earlier, we'll trust God with eternity, just probably not going to trust him with tomorrow. You know, I've got to keep my hand. I gotta, I've got to be the one who provides. I've got to be the one. You know, I'm going to pick myself up by my bootstraps. Or, 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 or it, gets, it seems kind of counterintuitive. I'll trust God with eternity and even with tomorrow, but I'm just not going to trust him with my hurts. I've got some past hurts, and they are, they are deep, and they, they, they are dirty, and I don't want to bring them up because I either maybe I don't want to let go of them. I don't want to see how God's going to move me past them. And so even though it seems kind of weird, I'm going to keep them even though they're painful because at least I know what I'm doing with them. And so it becomes this divided faith. We got faith in God. We got faith in ourselves. We got faith in our family. We got faith in our church. We got faith in religion. We got, we got faith in good works. We got faith in our money, faith in our dreams, right? And it becomes a divided faith. The divided faith will never rely on God's plans and purposes. If you're not familiar with the story of Cain and Abel, this is how it goes. I'm going to do this real quick. You ready? Buckle up. In Genesis chapter 1, easy memory verse, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. You with me? You read Genesis chapter 1, it's the story of creation. You read Genesis chapter 2, guess what it is? It's the story of creation. Chapter 1's a poem, chapter 2's a narrative. You read chapter 3, it's the fall of creation, right? It's what we call the fall, and if you're not familiar with that term, that's when Adam and Eve, the first two people, chose to not believe God. They believed God was holding out on them. They listened to Satan, and they sinned, and so humanity came into existence, and, and the relationship between God and man was fractured. Genesis chapter 3 is also where we find the plan for redemption, though, because God steps into the garden and doesn't obliterate Adam and Eve. He actually calls out, where are you? Not actually asking where they are, because he knows where they are, but, but in essence, by saying, where are you, what's he saying? He's saying, I'm coming for you. We see the gospel preached again when, when he talks about the realities of the fall of mankind, but he makes it known that one day the serpent's head's getting crushed. So that's Genesis 3. It's the fall and it's the beginning of redemption. Genesis 4, Adam and Eve have some babies. <laughs> and so Adam and Eve have Cain and Abel, they're brothers. Cain's a farmer, works the land. Abel's a rancher, he's got some sheep, right? This is how the story goes. It's time to sacrifice, right? Because they're sin, so they're, make, they're offering sacrifices. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 4 that Abel took, I don't know how many sheep he had. I know nothing about sheep, right? He, he, it just tells us he, he, he kept sheep. I don't know, he, he kept at least two because we know he had some baby sheep and this is pre-Dolly, there's no cloning sheep. So he's got to have at least two, right? You with me? Okay, so he's got at least two. Maybe he has more, I don't know. But he has some sheep and the, what it tells us is the, the sheep give him an offspring. He has a baby sheep and he takes the firstborn of the flock and he offers it to God. He didn't hold anything back. See, he could have kept the fat. There's some value in that. There's some use for that. But he takes the entire sheep and sacrifices it to God. What did he do in essence? Well, what could he have done, right? And, and, and our society promotes this and applauds it. Abel could have said, Here, here's, and I don't, this is really where I don't know about sheep. Like I've, ha I've had dogs and I know dogs have litters. I don't know if sheep come one by one, like four, I don't know. But anyways, one comes out at a time at least. And so he has the first one and he could have said, I'm going to set this sheep, you like that needed? <laughs> I'm going to set this sheep to the side just in case, like rainy day, I got I to gotta make some more sheep, right? That, this is how I feed my, I'm going to set this one to the side, but God, you know, maybe when the third one comes around, I'll, I'll sacrifice it. I want to sacrifice. I, I just need to take care of myself. Makes sense, doesn't it? Let, let's be real. Makes sense, doesn't it? But he doesn't do that. The firstborn of the flock, he sacrifices. Maybe you've read the story, you've been confused. Like, why is God a big meanie? Because the, the story tells us that, that Cain sacrificed also. But yet God was pleased with Abel's sacrifice and not with Cain's. What was the difference? See, Abel takes the firstborn of his flock and offers it. This is what Cain did. He works the ground, right? So he has a crop. And so the, it's time for harvest. He pulls the harvest and he takes the first fruits, literally, the, the first yield of the ground, and he takes it and he sets it aside for a rainy day. Man, I've, got to, you, I've, I've got to feed, I've got to provide, I've got to use this and the seeds from this to keep the farm going. So he, his first product from the land, if you will, he sets aside, and then the next crop, or somewhere down the line, he takes it and he sacrifices to God. Understand this, beloved, it had nothing to do with the actual sacrifice, it had to do with the heart behind it. Cain sacrificed with a divided heart. 
He had some faith in God, hence the sacrifice, but he had some faith in himself at least, hence the setting aside for a rainy day. You know, may, maybe you've been around church for a while and you've heard about the tithe. You're like, oh, here he goes again, right? You've heard about the tithe. If you haven't, it's, it's tithe is Hebrew word for tenth. What we believe as a church, we believe the scripture tells us that each month uh, we should give a tenth or, or, or throughout the course of a year, whenever we receive income, we should give a tenth of that, 10% to God. Not because he's lacking in funds, right? God did not implement the tithe because he needs it. He implemented the tithe because we need it. We need to have a life dependent upon him. And so you've heard maybe the tithe, maybe you've even heard preachers talk about the tithe being the first fruits, and that sounded weird, but then they explained, and what, maybe you've heard a preacher say, you should tithe, it should be your first fruit, and it should be the first check you write, and maybe you've thought to yourself, what does it matter, right? If my tithe is $100 a month, and if I write the check on the first or the 31st, what's the big difference? And that's a great question. The difference is not the check, the difference is the heart that writes it. Because when you write the $100 check on the first of the month, what's in front of you? All the bills, all the mouths that got to get fed, right? Your house payment, your car payment. You know, in front of you are all the things, all of your obligations, trying to save, paying off debt. Let me just remind you of this. You're like, I can't tithe because I'm in debt. It's not God's fault you're in debt, all right? But if you'll trust him, he'll see you out of it. I promise you that. And so all of that is in front of us when the check is first, right? When the check is last, it may still be the same check, but you have trusted yourself to get there. Which just side note for free, some of us have tried this approach. How many times when we write it last is there still $100 left? Right? Now I get it. It's, it's un, I'm going to say it. Right? It's unnerving sometimes to trust God that much. You know, I try to be transparent, and I believe that we should talk about struggles. I think it's okay to talk about, you know, victories. I can tell you that by God's grace, for 15 years that I've been married to Christy, we have faithfully given the tithe. But this is where, this is where I'll get real with you. Early on in our marriage, there were a lot of months when I sat next to my wife in church, and she would pull out the checkbook, and I would kind of begin to think, let's, let's do it next week. Like, this is kind of a tight, look. you know, I'd be like, hey, do it next week. By God's grace, you never listen to me. <laughs> what else is new? <laughs> Anybody want to take me to lunch? Anyways. <laughs> this is, what, I get it. And, and I'm not trying to make mountains out of molehills here, but when it's, when it's the first of the month, there's no question the heart behind it. And that was the difference here. Cain sacrificed with a divided, let, let me say it this way. Abel took the firstborn. Abel gave God his best. Cain gave God the rest, right? Cain got the best and said, I'm going to keep this to make sure I can keep, keep things going. But God, you can have some leftovers. Beloved, giving God leftovers is never the equation of a daring faith. Tipping God when the basket comes by because you want to make sure you put something in that month. It is not, I don't care the amount, you could put $10,000 in the basket. The amount is not, it's just like the amount of faith, it's the object. And a divided, I promise you, as long as you choose, and it's a choice, as long as you choose a divided faith, you will never believe the title that God has of Yahweh Yireh, the God who provides. You cannot claim that to be true with a divided faith. But when we, when we back up and say, God, I'm going to give, I'm, I'm just going to trust you, whether it's the tithe, wh whether it's our dreams, whether it's our hurts, doesn't matter what it is. When we give it to him with a daring faith, an undivided faith, we're believing him to be the one that provides. But as long as you think you have any part, now I'm not saying that daring faith is lazy. In fact, People with daring faith should be the hardest workers in the workforce because you know it's God who's given you that job to work at, right? You know, I told, I told 9 a.m., you know, some of us, we have jobs to work at and we, you know, we want to talk about how much we don't like our job and, you know, sometimes we have bad situations and, and as, as a community of believers, we should share our hurts. But, you know, there are some people, all they do is complain about their job. They're like, you know, I'm just, I don't know why God doesn't give me a new one because he gave you one that you haven't been thankful for yet. And so we begin to trust God with everything, and we believe him to be the one who's the provider. 
the provider of healing and hope and future and needs. And, and it's a daring faith that pushes us there. Now, what about Enoch? Enoch is an interesting dude, right? You know, I, I mean, I don't know how for years now preachers have taken the subject of Enoch and done a 60 minute. I, don't, I mean, I, I understand how you do a 60 minute sermon. Like, I do it, but at least I'm doing, you know, six verses here. But this is, what, this is what the Bible, this is the entirety of the story of Enoch. We, we see him referenced here in Hebrews 11. But in Genesis chapter 5, there's the lineage, right? You know, like Adam had a son and this guy had a son. So Genesis 5, somewhere around verse 24, more or less, what we find out is that Enoch lives, this is, this is the, the scripture on Enoch. Enoch lived 65 years and had a son named Methuselah, and then he lived 300 more years. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God and was not, for the Lord took him. That's it. And like somehow dudes turned that into 60 minutes. Joking aside, you know what? You know, you know what's amazing? Like, we, we, we talk about the story of Enoch. And, and so, obviously, you got a little bit about his, his, his life. That's not really where, you know, we focus. We focus on the verse that says, Enoch walked with God and was not, for the Lord took him. And you know what we do? We take that verse and we say, you know what's so powerful about the verse is that, and what that means, by the way, is that Enoch was, was living and he was faithful and then God took him. And as Hebrews tells us, he didn't see death. Like, one day he's here, one day he's not. People start looking for him and he, they can't find the dude, right? Because God took him. He didn't die. And so we talk about that and we go, man, what an amazing reality. And we take the, we make the crux of the story, the climax of the story, the fact that God took Enoch and we miss it. The power in the story of Enoch, the one verse that we have, isn't that the Lord took him. The power is that Enoch walked with God. Hebrews 11 tells us that he was commended by his faith. And as such, the Lord took him, but then it repeats, the author of Hebrews repeats himself to make it clear. He was commended before he was taken. <laughs> Enoch walked with God. Now, this is a similar principle to a controversial character in Scripture. I'm going I'm to stir up the hornet's nest here. It's the same principle with Mary, the mother of Jesus. See, what's happened in churches, and, and especially maybe even churches in our community, is there's been pendulum shifts. So on one hand, people say, you know, Mary's equal with Jesus and she should be worshiped. That, that's blasphemy. It just, it just is. It's nowhere in Scripture. Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah alone, no help. But then a pendulum swings the other way. It's like, oh, we can't even talk about Mary. Like, you know, we're going to sing the song. We can't even, it's like, Mary, did you know? You know, I mean, we can't, we can't even, like, go there. It's like, oh, you, you, you mentioned the name of Mary. You're worshiping Mary. And, and both are ridiculous, okay? It's okay to, 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 to talk about Mary because God did. But if you know the story, Mary is betrothed to Joseph, right? So it's a little bit different. It's kind of like engagement, but more serious. She's going to marry Joseph. She's a virgin. And then an angel appears to her and issues the most sarcastic angelic line ever that they always do, fear not. Real easy when you're a glowing heavenly being. But fear not. And then he tells her, for you have found what? Favor with the Lord. So, you with me? All right, let's put it all together. If you found favor with someone, is that person pleased with you? Okay. Hebrews chapter 11, 11 verse 6 tells us that without faith, it's impossible to please God. So God was pleased with Mary, so she must have had what? Faith. And if you don't believe me, just finish the story. Because when she received the news from the angel, we know how it goes, but she didn't know that at the moment. She was most likely feeling some uncertainty in her heart about the potential divorce that was coming her way, the possible execution, and should she live a life of being an outsider and her son being rejected. Right? I mean, she, she, she's got to go tell Joseph, hey, I'm pregnant, but don't worry, it's God's. <laughs> she didn't know the angel was going to go to Joseph, right? We know how the story goes. And so, yeah, we, we should... We should commend Mary, not because of anything other than the faith that she exemplified. Enoch walked with God and was not, oh, church, that we would be knots for God. You catch what I'm saying? The people around the valley could just say, those people at BT, man, they walk with God. I don't know, it's kind of weird. I mean, that there, there wouldn't be anything else to feel. They, they, they just walk with God. Enoch walked with God and was not. 
It's an undivided, an undivided faith. You know, as we talk about that, it's important we remind ourselves of kind of the mission that we're on. We've put it on, on our walls. It's on our website. We talk about new members. Our, our mission statement, BT, exists to glorify God by leading people to live transformed lives through biblical teaching, relevant worship, global concern, and authentic community, right? It's our purpose statement, mission statement. But if you just look at the front end of it, BT exists to glorify God. That's what it's all about. We believe that the best way to glorify God is by making disciples, leading people to live transformed lives. You with me? So we believe that our primary mission in glorifying God is seeing people in the Rio Grande Valley and beyond cross the line of faith from death to life and come to know Jesus as their Savior. That's what we're all about. And so if that's what we're all about, seeing lives transformed by the work of Jesus applied to their life, then it begs the question and brings up the reality. See, this is what we know to be true. Not everyone trusts Jesus to be their Savior, right? Right? It's a sobering reality, and it should cause an urgency in our hearts. But not everyone trusts Jesus to be their Savior. And so what we believe to be true according to the Scripture, when someone lives through this life and never places their faith, I'm not talking about church attendance, baptism, religion. I'm saying placing their faith in Jesus, acknowledging him to be their Savior. When that does not happen, they spend eternity separated from him, and we call that eternity hell. You with me? So putting everything together, it begs the question, what condemns people to hell? You know, what we kind of default to say is it's sin. Sin condemns people to hell. But if you think about it, it's a lack of faith. The only sin that's not forgivable is rejecting Jesus. It's choosing not to trust him, not to put our faith in him. It's the only one that, 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 that's unforgivable. And so people are condemned to hell, not by their sins, but by their lack of faith. Beloved, sinners go to heaven. They're just sinners covered by the blood of Jesus. And so we, we begin to get to the heart of the issue here, of what a daring faith is really all about. And so I just ask you this question as I wrap up. What are areas today in your life that you need to choose a daring faith? What are areas in your life where you, where you need to stop giving God the rest and start giving him the best? It might be the tithe. It might be your time. It might be your affections. It might be your dreams. But what's that next step for you? What, what, what are the areas that we need to, to let go of things? Beloved, I am saying this in full sincerity. I know that it can be unnerving and scary to, to lose control. But, but how can we ever accept Christ's strength if we won't lose ours? We love Philippians 4.13, for I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But you can never do all things if you're only using part of the strength of Jesus. How, how can we walk in his strength if we refuse to let go of our own? I know that it's unnerving. I know that it's unsettling. We talk about a daring faith, and we're talking about things that, that are uncomfortable. I'm asking you to think of those areas in your life where you need to let go, right? The old phrase, let go and let God. And it may be a dream. It may be a situation in your life. It may be a relationship that you, you, you can't fix. It may, it may be a hurt. It may be a habit. You know, I think it, it takes great faith to let go of some hurts. And I think there are some people in this room right now, and you've got deep wounds. You have great hurts. Somewhere in the course of your life, terrible things have taken place. Physical abuse, mental abuse, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse. And you have never brought it out into the light. You just kind of stuffed it down. And it's scary to trust God with that. What's he going to do with it? It, it? it may mean talking about it and, and reopening the wound. You know, some of you have mastered the art of secret sin. You come here and it looks great and you've got some addiction, some substance, pornography, some affair, physical or emotional. You've got something hidden in the recesses of your life. 
and you feel convicted every Sunday to come forward and to bring it out, but you know, you're scared because what, you know, what if you get pushed aside? There's dreams that you're scared to let go of because what if God, what if his plans and purposes don't match your, your dreams and your hopes? Beloved, I believe with all my heart that right now in this moment, God is revealing some things. And it may be painful right now, but hear me, God reveals what he intends to heal. You know, this past week I went to the doctor, I had a physical, right? I had a checkup. Before I went to the doctor, I told my wife, hey, there, you know, she's known there's some things, I'm kind of some minor concerns. And she said, you need to tell the doctor. I'm like, I ain't telling the doctor about those things, right? If I bring it up, he's gonna do something about it. I, And so, you know, I, I went to the doctor, and because I want to be a good husband, I told them, right? And so because I brought them up, there's some steps that are going to be taken to try to correct these problems. But even though I could have gone to the doctor, and he's a great doctor, highly qualified, med school graduate, residency, board certified, all those things. Highly regarded doctor in the valley. And I could have sat on the table and he could have checked my ears and my throat and he could have done all the things that come with a physical. And I never could have told him some of those concerns. And I could have left there with no plan to have those concerns healed. You know, the difference is that God already knows the things that you think are unrevealed. They're only unrevealed by you. But because he desires willful submission and worship, he's waiting for you to trust him. See, if he just kind of barges in, and he can. If he just kind of barges in and does it, it's not faith. And so he's moving right now. He's revealing, I believe, right now. And the, the struggle is you, you, you hear me, but you hear the voice of the enemy. And the enemy says, you will always be that scarred person. Life will just be life. You will always be, you can't move past that. Those things can't be undone. You can never let go of that addiction because you know it's who you are. You can't believe that God's going to do something because you don't feel him, see him, or hear him. So he obviously isn't there. But beloved, I'm telling you, he is. So I'm going to ask the ministers to come forward. And as they begin to come forward, I want to I want to read these lyrics from song. It's called Trust His Heart, and this is the chorus. And I believe this is the tension that many of us right now are sitting in. And in just a minute, you'll have to choose to be obedient and to come forward or to keep that hurt or to keep that hang up or to keep that fear and not choose faith. And I know, I know that we, you, you've come in here and for many of us, maybe, you've come in here not feeling, not seeing, not hearing the Lord, and you're wondering what's going on. Take heart and let this fuel your faith. It says, God is too wise to be mistaken, and God is too good to be unkind. And so when you don't understand, when you can't see his plan, when you can't trace his hand, when you can't see him, when you can't feel him, when you can't hear him, trust his heart. So I'm just asking you, would you trust his heart today? I ask you to stand. We're going to sing a song that some of you may know and some of you may, know, may not. I, I just want, I want you to hear these lyrics before you sing them so you understand what we're saying. Because because the song represents the crux of the matter. The song represents what will or won't happen today. You've got hurts, you've got hang-ups, you've got dreams, you've got fears, you've got confusion, and you've got a God ready to step in. And the song that we're gonna sing, it goes like this. It says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. Do you need some things to grow strangely dim in your life? The things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Beloved, you may not feel him, you may not see him, you may not hear him, but if you will trust his heart, I promise the things he's done before, he'll do again for you. And so would you trust him?
there are some right now and the depth of the trust that you need is to trust him as your savior you need to quit playing games with Jesus and quit playing games with church and quit thinking that showing up and doing stuff is enough and you need to resign your life to him and you need to come forward and you need to grab someone by the hand one of these men one of these women and you need to say today I need to trust Jesus that's all you gotta do so I'm gonna pray and when I'm done praying and we start singing I'm gonna ask you to come forward Father, in this moment, would you prepare our hearts for what you want to do? Father, I pray for the hurts being revealed. I pray for the hang-ups being revealed. I pray for the fears that are before us. And what I pray is that the voice of the enemy who speaks condemnation and false identity to be silenced. And I pray for your voice to be clear, God. Father, today, would you bring about salvation? Would you bring about restoration, hope, and healing? And would it be for your glory?